I'm excited to be here on this uh, Student Sunday of all days. Uh, if you walked in late and you're like, Student Sunday, um, we actually had students come down and prayed for them. It was kind of cool. Um, if you're one of those students who was supposed to be here, I have gifts for you. Um, let this be a lesson for you, though. Maybe show up to class on time. 10.30 means 10.30. I don't even think I'm talking to anyone. Just thought it would be funny to say that. So uh, it's, it's good to see you guys here this morning. Uh, does anybody else love this time of year here in Cicero? Like, when it's cold outside, Cicero, um, let's be honest, is boring. Uh, it's dead. It's kind of a drag to live here. Uh, in the winter, not, not because of the people. I mean, it's like there's nothing to do and really nobody to be seen in this frozen wasteland. But when the sun comes out, boy, does this town come alive, doesn't it? Right? Like, just walk down to Alexander's. That you'll see, like, a hundred people for the next three months, right? Doesn't matter what time of day. I love it around here in the summer. And uh, funny thing, summertime for me, it, this isn't true anymore, but it used to always signal like summer job time. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like su summer job time happens when the sun comes out. And I always had jobs, uh, they were mostly not fun. I got them through my uncles or just people I knew. Actually, I think they were all through my uncles. Um, some were good, some were bad, uh, but there's one in particular that, that sticks out in my mind. And it's, the reason it sticks out in my mind is because people in my family make fun of me for a certain thing that happened there all the time. You see, uh, I w my job was to like, just do all the things that nobody else wanted to do in the sheet metal shop. That was sheet metal. So I like, swept floors, and I cleaned up the metal working machines, and I painted. I painted a lot. <clears throat> Uh, specifically, I painted a couple bathrooms, but I didn't paint the bathrooms by myself. I had another guy who was working with me. He was another high schooler at the time. And it, it, there were three bathrooms, and it just so happened that I had painted before. I had a little experience, so I was a little faster than him. In fact, I, I painted two bathrooms in the time it took him to paint one of them. And if I'm being completely honest and humble, mine looked way better than his. Uh, like, it wasn't even close. He would do, like, the, have you ever seen somebody who paints where it's, like, they, they dip it, and then they're, like, psh, like, and then they just spread that out? That's what he did, and I taped mine off, and I used, like, rollers, and, man, it looked great when I was done. But while I was, while I was painting in this bathroom, uh, I, I figured out that if I grabbed a five-gallon bucket, I could sit on this bucket and then slide it down along the bottom part of the wall, and paint as I went, right, and paint around the toilets and the fixtures and all this stuff, and it made me go faster, like, I, I was faster because I was doing this, but one day while I was painting this guy, I think his name was Tim, I don't really remember, uh, I've repressed many of these memories uh, from working here, but Tim walks in, and he's like, look at you, you lazy son of a gun, he, I'm gonna filter the words that they use, look at you, you lazy son of a gun, sitting on your butt in here, instead of working hard, I'm like, First thing that came to mind is like, oh, okay, this guy, he's just joking, right? He's just razzing the young guy like you do. But then a couple days later, my uncle, who had been working in the field most of this week, he came into the shop, and he's like, hey, man, we need to talk. Word's getting around here. You're kind of a lazy son of a gun, and that's just not going to fly. You're a Pollock, right? I was, I was actually a third-generation guy who worked here. My grandpa worked in this sheet metal shop for, I think, 117 years, something like that. And my uncle worked there starting when he was 17, so I was a third-generation guy, and apparently being a Pollock was a big deal in the shop. And I was doing it all wrong because I was sitting on this stupid bucket, and I was like, oh my gosh, you guys are kidding, right? Like, I, I didn't believe them. I thought they were just messing with me at first. And the second thing that came to mind, I was like, maybe sheet metal shop bathroom painting isn't the career path for me. Maybe I should try something else, um, Maybe I should actually pay attention in class and stuff like that. Maybe this isn't the path for me. And the last thing that kind of came to mind is, like, I think we're speaking a different language. Like, I understand the words that you're using, but what you're saying doesn't even make sense to me. Like, why do you care if I'm sitting on this bucket? I'm going faster than the other guy. Mine looks better than the other guy. Nobody's giving him a hard time. Why do you even care that I'm sitting on this bucket? It's like we were speaking 
a different language. And the, the thing I want to talk about today is this idea of, of different languages really kind of based on our generation. The first, like, 15, 20 years of our life really creates a lens through which we see the world. And we kind of carry that with us. Whether or not we're aware of it and whether or not it's, like, been intentionally handed to us, that's just kind of how it works. And I think a lot of times there's this tension between generations. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like, like I hear from parents and grandparents all the time, they're like, oh my gosh, I have this like wisdom or this knowledge or this experience, and I, I see you heading down a path, and I wish I could just like put this knowledge inside of you, but every time I try, it's like I, I start yelling for some reason, or you just get defensive, and you turn your ears off, and stuff starts bouncing off, and the eyes start rolling, and oh my gosh, it's like I don't know how to speak your language. Do you know what I'm talking about? And younger people, I think in the same way, we sometimes, it's like, I'd like to have a great relationship with my parents, but as soon as they start talking to me, it doesn't matter what it's about, as soon as they start talking, I get, I get mad for some reason. They say something, and it ticks me off, and then I'm like blinded by anger, and I don't want to be that way, and I know I'm kind of being a jerk, but I can't, I can't get out of this, and I, it's like I don't know how to speak their language, and they, sh- they certainly don't know how to speak my language. You guys know what I'm talking about? So today, I want to I hopefully help move us forward on this. You see, I don't, I don't think this is the way it's supposed to be. I think this is the way it often is, but I don't think this is the way it's supposed to be, especially for us who call ourselves followers of Jesus. You see, when we, we decide to follow Jesus, I think that the most important thing about us changes. I think the most important thing is no longer when we're born or what color we are or what gender we are or how much money we make. I I think the most important thing about us becomes that we are followers of Jesus. That's our new identity. We're adopted into a new family. In fact, there's this guy, Peter, who hung out with Jesus quite a bit. In in fact, Jesus referred to Peter as the rock on which Jesus was going to build the church. Peter was kind of like a big deal when it comes to these original followers of Jesus, And and Peter talks about how we are supposed to be, like, we're adopted into a new family. He wrote a whole letter on it. You can check it out. It's 1 Peter. But at the end of this, he kind of talks about what our relationships are supposed to look like when it comes to, like, cross-generational stuff. And I'm going to talk about this, and let's start. Peter starts by saying, to the elders among you. And when, when Peter says elders, this is what I... I want you to hear, I, I don't want you to hear like the, the five or six elders that we have like on a board. That, I don't think that's what Peter's talking about. I think Peter's talking about like you guys who are older, right? If, if you're older, like if you're ahead of someone, if you're a stage ahead of someone in life and you care about them, this, I'm, I'm about to talk to you. I think that's what Peter's saying. He goes on to say, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Peter talks about how when we're the older generation, like when we're, when we're in a relationship with someone who's a stage of life behind us, as the older person there, we, we should be like eager to serve this generation. We should serve over this flock, not not for dishonest gain, not trying to bend them to our will, not trying to make ourselves look good, but because we actually care about them. When I, when I read this, I think of my grandma. My grandma has the least selfish motives of, like, anyone on this planet when it comes to me. She would, like, lay in the street if it meant me getting ahead in life. She wants so desperately for me and all of her grandkids to succeed in life, not for any, like, not for any selfish gain, just because that's how much She loves us, and I think this is what Peter is describing. We, that when we have younger people in life, we should want them to succeed just because they're part of our family. Peter goes on to say, not lording it over those entrusted you, but being examples to the flock. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive your own crown of glory that will never fade away. Peter kind of gets up, gives us a hint here, not lording it over them, not, not like as authoritarians, but as as like fellow walkers down this path called life, right? This is the difference between, you know, do as I say, not as I do. And here, walk, like, walk with me. I want to show you how to do this. 
right here. Come here. Let me help you with this because I, I want you to win at this. I want you to win at life. I think this is the posture that Peter is describing. For those of us who have younger people in our lives that we care about. He doesn't just stop talking to the older generation. He moves on to say, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourself to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves in humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. As a young person who, like, I want to win too. And I understand that there are a lot of things in this life that I could learn by paying attention to other people instead of learning it the hard way myself, right? If I can, if I can pay attention, if I can tune in to what other people are saying, I can get a leg up on life instead of just learning everything the hard way. But it takes a posture of humility. It takes a posture of open-handedness, of understanding that I don't have all the information, no matter how smart we might think we are. And when Peter describes this, man, I think this is what we all want. No matter where we are in the spectrum, we probably all have people, most of us have people ahead of us, and most of us have people behind us, right? And we want this kind of relationship. We want to be able to grow with people, and we want people to be invested in us, and we are invested in other people. This kind of relationship is what it's supposed to look like to be part of this family of God. So today, I want to help bridge the gap a little bit. Because I, I know what it feels like to just, oh, like, you're not speaking my language. I know what it feels like to, to feel like we're unable to connect. So today, m my title here is Next Generation Pastor. And, and part of my job is to stand in this gap, to be an advocate in both directions between generations. So that's, that's what I want to try to do today. And I want to start by talking to the younger people in this room. Now, uh, the youngest people are like Gen Zers, but I'm not just talking to you. I'm also talking to myself. And if you have a person who is ahead of you in life that you think you could learn from, I hope this will apply to you. And the first thing I want to say to you is don't assume that everyone values the same things that you do. Don't assume that everyone values the same things you do. This is what I was running up against in the sheet metal shop. You see, what I was valuing was, like, speed and efficiency and going home at the end of the day without my knees and my back hurt, like, hurting from kneeling on the concrete. Guess what the other guy was valuing? I'll give you a hint. He didn't care even a little bit about my knees and my back hurting, right? What he valued was hard work. He valued working hard, and not just working hard, but being seen by other people as someone who works hard. And for me to sit on this bucket was going directly against that value of hard work. It didn't matter how much better it was uh, as far as speed and efficiency. It didn't matter. I wasn't working hard to him, and I didn't understand, right? I, like, why do you care? This, this, I said this a thousand times. Why do you care that I was sitting on a bucket? Like, it didn't affect anything about my performance, and it's because we valued different things. So I think we need to stop assuming that everyone values the same things that we do. Which leads me to my next point, which is this. I think we need to start working to understand the game before we start competing, right? If I said, hey, let's go play basketball, and you're like, what's basketball? And I'm like, it's, it's a game. Let's play, right? Without giving you any instruction about what I'm trying to accomplish and what it means to win, right? That's not really going to be fun, is it? And in the same way, if we enter, engage in conversations with people and we don't know what they're trying to accomplish, what, it, what a win looks like for them, we're going to have some friction, aren't we? Young people, I want to help you like clue in on this a little bit. I, I said earlier, the, the first 15 to 20 years of our life really gives us a lens through which we see the world. What's happening in the world around us changes what we value in a lot of ways. For instance, I'll start with the, the builder generation. Have you guys heard of this before? They're also known as like the traditionalists or the golden generation. They have some pretty cool titles. But these guys are pretty much everyone born before World War II. What was going on in the world before World War II? Great Depression and then World War II. And if you were born into this chaotic world, you learned a couple things. First, you learned that it takes sacrifice for us to all make it. Right? I, it, as a parent, it, you had to sacrifice so that your family had food and shelter. Right? You could work like a dog 
and not provide for your family. That's just the way the world was at this point. So people coming out of this generation are often uh, willing to sacrifice. They see the greater good. That, that was uh, a huge theme during World War II, is, is sacrificing for the greater good. So this generation is, is pretty thrifty, often, right? They're, they're savers. They're going to they're gonna put it away, right? Think of, this is my grandparents' generation. If you walk into my grandma's house, the number one item in her house, like the whole thing, it, well, actually, my grandpa's tractor collection is pretty big, like toy tractor. But my grandma's Cool Whip container collection <laughs> is way bigger, right? Do you, does anybody know what I'm talking about? She has 8 billion old Cool Whip and cottage cheese containers. Because why would you ever throw that away? You've paid for it. You might need it someday, like 30, 35 years down the road. Why would you ever throw that thing away? You know what I'm talking about, right? The, the first 15, 20 years of our life shapes the way we see the world. After, after this generation, does anybody know what the generation right after World War II was called? Baby boomers. Yes, baby boomers. That's because we, we were feeling pretty good about ourselves after World War II, right? Back-to-back -back World War champions, we were, we were feeling pretty good about ourselves, Right? And we were really happy to not be in a world war anymore. So, like, what all, everybody wanted to do, we just wanted to go back home and start a family and carve out our little slice of America. And in fact, we were really good at the starting a family part. There was a boom of babies, right? We didn't know what to do. We had so many babies and children, we didn't know what to do. Hospitals were packed, schools were packed. And because of this, everything being so crowded, there was a sense of competition, Right? If you wanted something, you had to work harder than the other people around you. If you didn't work hard, then they were going to get it. They were going to get the job. They were going to get the spot on the team. They were going to get whatever it was. So people coming out of this generation are experiencing a, a pretty nice upswing in the economy. Everybody's feeling, you know, we, we finally have time. This is the first generation that is not, like, most people aren't worried about where their food and shelter are going to come with, come from. So we, they, they were able to think about me. What, what do I like? What, what's going to work best for me? Sometimes they're called the me generation. Seems derogatory. I would never say that. But <clears throat> the me generation, they, they, they are all about working hard, right, to carve out a slice of America for me, which is, which is really cool, right? But then, we, I think we all know that you can't keep going up and up forever. The economy can't keep growing forever, and that's where Gen X comes, right? Gen X is the generation after the boomers. You see, these guys, uh, they, they missed, like, the economic growth, but they hit all the, the price, like, all the raising prices. These guys kind of get the short stick uh, in a couple of ways. One, that, like, all the boomers have taken all the jobs and all the houses, so everything's expensive, and you can't have anything nice because the boomers have taken it all, right? I don't know. I wasn't there. That's what I've read. But also, things like divorce are on the rise, right? Families aren't, don't look the same way they used to, and, and it's like we're starting to grow suspicious of the politicians that we're supposed to trust, right? We can fact check the news now. That's new. So this Gen X group of people kind of comes out a little suspicious, a little, like, a little leery of the man, if you will. And they also come out uh, feeling like family, like they're, they're kind of from a time where family wasn't Im as important. The parents were... Uh, out of the house, like moms were working for the first time. You know, Rosie the Riveter stuff. That's the, that was her parents. So Gen X, uh, the next generation that comes along is kind of a pendulum swing from Gen X, right? From family not being very important to family being the most important thing, and specifically not the family, but the kids of the family. And what generation is this? Millennials, Right? We thought millennial, our millennial children were the most special thing to ever grace this planet. We told them that, and, uh, and when I say we, I mean I was told this, and we believed it, right? We all got a trophy, because Lord forbid one of us didn't understand that we were special, right? And we grew up thinking that, hey, I'm special. I should get a trophy. Well, why? Because I want it, right? That's... That's kind of our 
reputation, and this filter that we get from the first 20 years of our life really affects how we see things, and it really kind of establishes some values that we don't even think about a lot of the time. We haven't consciously decided to value these things. That's just an, a byproduct of the world into which we were born. And I think if we can understand that a little bit, we have like a leg up on understanding other people and connecting, especially across generations. Let's move on. The third thing I want to say <clears throat> to young people is this. Assume that there's something you don't know. In, your, in these conversations where there's conflict, where there's disagreement, if you can just take this posture of humility to assume that there's something you don't know, I think this is going to serve you well the rest of your life. Now, I didn't say assume you're wrong. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm saying assume there's something you don't know. Assume there's an experience or a piece of information that if you had it, you would probably think the same way the, this other person does. Right? If, if, I, if I had lived the same life you had, I would probably think the same way you do. But, but I'm missing something. So that leads me to my fourth piece of advice for you guys is ask questions. If we assume there's something we don't know, and we ask questions just like all the time, I think we can start developing a, a sense of understanding of what other people are feeling. I think asking questions is a great way to see what people value and why they value that, right? If we have conversation, it's like, why, why do you think this was so important to you and your generation when it's not as important now? And why do you think what is important to us wasn't as big of a deal to you guys, right? These questions are a great way to learn about other people and connect across generations. And one other thing, I, I think questions are a great way to value someone else's input by asking for more of their input. Right? It, we can value what someone else is bringing to the table in these conversations by asking for more of it. They're, asking questions is a great thing to do in relationships, especially when you're, you're out of sync with each other. And the last thing I want to say for you young people, I think a baller move is to start paying for lunch. Right? <laughs> if you invite someone ahead of you in life, right? Hey, I'd like to pick your brain. I'd like to have a conversation, or we need to talk about this. And then you pay for lunch. What better a way of showing somebody what you're about, right? Especially if somebody's like, oh, you're just a selfish, entitled young kid. All you're worried about is you, you, you. Like, this act of generosity is a great way to break this barrier, right? To get somebody, oh, like, wasn't expecting that. So my last piece of advice for you young people is pay for lunch, right? Especially when we're like, in high school and college, and paying for lunch is genuinely like a sacrifice of generosity, that's a baller move. All right, let's move on. Um, that, I hope you wrote those down, young people, because I'm going to move on to the older generations. And when I talk about older generations connecting with younger generations, the, the easiest place to go is like parenting, right? I think a lot of us think parenting or grandparenting, and I am neither of those things. So I don't want to stand up here and pretend to be a parenting expert, but what I do want to help is I, I like, I want to help you connect with younger people, right? So this isn't limited, like, I'm not pretending to know something that I have no experience in. All I'm saying is, if you have a younger person in your life, I think these things will help you, right? Which includes parents and grandparents and just people trying to mentor young people or just people who just care about other young people. So uh, let's move into this. The first thing I want to say to you older people is don't assume that everyone values the same things that you do. <laughs> right? We're all products of our system. We didn't choose to be born into what we were born into. And if, if we just assume everyone should value the same things we do, guess what? That doesn't work. It's like we're speaking a different language. So the first thing I want to say to you older generation is don't assume that everyone values the same things that you do. Now, which that leads me on to my, my second point is, I think you should try to understand the game you're playing before you start competing. Those are the only two that are the same, so don't worry. You haven't heard this all already. Right? The same thing I was saying earlier. If you want to connect with somebody, if you want to engage in a meaningful conversation, I, I think it's important to know what other people value, what other people uh, are, care about, what's important to them. I think it's important to know what kind of world they grew up in. Because like I said earlier, this creates our lens through which we see the rest 
of our lives. And if, I want to help you with this. So if you want to think about young people today, think of today's scene, right? S-C-E-N-E. This, is, uh, this should hopefully be a helpful framework for you. This came from a guy named Tim Elmore. And the first thing in today's scene that we know is our world is like loving speed, right? The, the new computer is this many times faster. These processors go this many times faster. And like, businesses are trying to make the experience faster. Everything, we love speed, don't we? Right? And I think we all do, right? This is just how it, does anybody like, man, I wish this took a lot longer, right? You see, you hear people say that very often? No, we don't. The second thing in our scene of today is we live in a world of convenience, right? We want it to be fast and easy, right? I don't, I don't want to have to get into my car, or I don't want to have to get out of my car. To, I don't even want to get into my car. I want you, that thing to come to me, right? How, like, how far do you have to go to get food from, like, any restaurant to you now? There are companies who their job is to go get food for you and bring it to you, right? We love convenience, and not just young people. I think we all love convenience. Like, have you ever heard somebody saying, gosh, I wish this were less convenient, no, right? Unless we're talking about, like, I live above a pizza shop, and it's too convenient to go get pizza, and now I'm, out, like, I'm overweight. Like, maybe in that scenario, but we probably still love the pizza, right? Nobody is arguing for a less convenient world. Let's move on. We also live in a world of entertainment. If, if I go to the bank, and I, I go to stand in line which I rarely have to do today because of the convenience of my banking app. But in the event that I do have to go talk to an actual person, you'll see me get in line, and I probably have like a two count before what happens. I pull out my phone, right? Because my phone is far more entertaining than staring at this guy's head, right? We, we love to be entertained. Our, our world is just in love with entertainment. And that's not bad. Anybody ever like saying, oh, I wish this was less entertaining. You know, I was engaged the whole time. It was awful. We don't, we don't talk like that. We like it. We also live in a world of nurture. Think of nurture, safety. We live in a world that is just obsessed with being safe. The easiest way to think about this is, uh, is anybody 50 or older in here? You don't have to raise your hands. Um, how many bike helmets did you and your friends have between you all? Like, maybe Tim had one that is, someone got him, but he didn't use it. Riding bikes was not a thing done in helmets, right? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> but today, I, I just had this crazy thing happen this week. A uh, couple, we have middle school stuff on Wednesday, so I was hanging with middle schoolers, and one girl rode her bike uh, to middle school stuff this week, and one of her friends at one point ran, jumped on the bike, and took off with it, and she was furious, like the owner of the bike was very upset, but not because she took the bike. She was upset because she took the bike and left the helmet, and I'm like, what are you, she's like, get back here and put that helmet on. I'm like, what is wrong with you? She's fine. Leave her alone, right? We're obsessed with safety, and we, we nurture ourselves today. And the last one, the last part of this scene of today is I think we live in a world of entitlement. I've only been here for 25 years, and I, I, I know that my generation is known for feeling entitled. But I, I've been told by many people that it's not just young people. I think everyone feels a little more entitled to things these days. Everyone feels like I should have it faster and now, and I, like if I'm paying, then I get to treat you however I want. We're entitled to things more today than we ever were. And to be honest, I think some of this entitlement is good. I think it's a good thing that we're moving towards, like everyone is entitled to be treated with dignity and respect. We should all feel like we are all entitled to, to be treated with dignity and respect because we're breathing right? Our Heavenly Father ascribed this value to us when we were born. We should treat each other. We are entitled to this as creations of our Heavenly Father. Not all entitlement is bad, but we live in a world that is being marked by that today. All of us 
live in this world, all right? This, this is the scene of all of our world, but imagine how much more this would influence you if you were born into it rather than being adopted into it, right? If you were born into a world of speed and convenience and entertainment and nurture and entitlement, these things would affect you differently than somebody who is just adopted into this world. There are, I, I believe there are a couple uh, unintended consequences of our world moving in this direction. The first one is, if we live in a world of speed, we can start to think that slow is bad. If we live in a world of convenience, we can start to think that anything hard is bad. If we live in a world of entertainment, we can start to think that anything that's boring is bad. A world of safety and nurture teaches us that risk is bad. And the world of entitlement te- teaches us that hard work and labor are bad. Now, as, as I was listening to those things, none of us really like those things. Like, none of us, who enjoys being bored? Like, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, I'm going to try and go get bored. Like, nobody's arguing for that. But most of the best things in life come through these hard things, right? Come through these uncomfortable things. Like, the best kind of relationships are not the ones that are, like, built overnight. The, the, the best and most meaningful relationships are the ones that are slow and take time, and you have to work on them, right? It's hard work to get those kind of relationships in your life. It, we know that uh, developmentally, our brains need to be bored sometimes, right? It's, it's in boredom that our brain learns to, to think in certain ways, and that, like, creativity and ingenuity, th- these things are, are, like, that the workout for these types of brain activities happen through boredom. It's important that we're bored, even though none of us really like it. And I, I think we all know that, like, some of the best things in life are risky, right? To put yourself out there d- relationally, like, n- it takes risk to, to have deep and meaningful relationships because you have to be vulnerable with other people. That's a, that's a risk, but that's where the best relationships happen. And imagine growing up in a world where these things are being taught to you, right? Uh, us younger people, we, we need help in these categories. We, we need help learning how to, to do the hard things that our world is trying to take away from us, which we like, right? That's why it's called an unintended consequence. Let's move on. I think us older people... Uh, older generations need to start personalizing statistics. And that might sound funny. Personalizing statistics. What I mean by that is if you hear like a one in five, one in five young people does this. Fill in the blank. One in five young people does this. That one in five is kind of out there, isn't it? Right? That's like one in five of those people out there. But if we say there's a 20% chance that my young person is going to go through this, that's different. There's a 20% chance my young person is going to deal with this thing. Let me give you some t- statistics here. Three out of four people will have sex before they're 20. There's a 75% chance your, your young person is going to wrestle, like m- move into this category of premarital stuff. Right? There's a 75% chance that's going to happen. Three, or sorry, seven in ten students consume alcohol before they graduate high school. Seven in ten. There's a 70% chance that the, the young person you care about is going to start experimenting with alcohol before their brain is old enough to handle it. There's a 35% chance that your, like, your young person is going to start experimenting with alcohol before they're 15. Now, when we personalize these statistics, I think this gives us an opportunity, which is my next point. I think what we need to do is pre-decide our response. If we we understand that there's a a 75% chance of anything, we kind of lose our right to be surprised by it, don't we? Like, if I, if I said, hey, we're going, uh, we're taking a, a, a high school trip, the, we're going bungee jumping, uh, there's a 75% chance the rope will snap, um, but we're going to try it out and see what happens. If you send your kid on that trip, and then you're surprised that they don't come home alive, 
That's kind of on, like, that surprised is on you, isn't it? Right? We need to not be surprised when kids go down a path that they're statistically going towards. And when we pre-decide our response, I think we get the opportunity to say, we're going we're gonna to handle this conversation the right way. Because when we leave it up to our gut reaction, what do we usually do? We blow up. Oh my gosh, how could you ever do that? When, when I was younger, we didn't, right? You would never hear of this when I was in school. And when we blow up like that, what are we communicating? That we're not really a safe place. And I don't mean safe place like these, these schools, like you don't have to engage with anything you don't like. I mean a safe place as in they can go to you when they're hurting and know they won't be hurt more. And if we, can, like, if we want to be the kind of person that someone goes to when stuff hits the fan, that has to be established before it hits the fan. If you want to be the place where your young person goes when stuff isn't going great in their life, then you need to be that kind of person before stuff starts going not so great in their life. How different is this, it, it, like, this response of blowing up to, oh man, that's a big deal, right? We should talk about that. There's this thing we do uh, where we kind of rank people between safest and least safe in our life when we have a secret, right? When we have a secret, I think most of us kind of intuitively know this thing's probably coming to life at some point. And what we do when we have that secret is, is put little feelers out, right? Like if I'm, I'm dealing with, like, I, okay, I went to a party this weekend, did something I wasn't proud of. Mom, what do you think, like, some kids got in trouble for drinking alcohol at school. What do you think of that? Oh my gosh, I can't believe any young kid would do that. Like, we've just pretty much guaranteed that if they're dealing with that thing, they're not going to come to us, right? Because they've shown, they've di been disgusted, right? When, we, when we're disgusted by stuff like that, man, do you want to go, like, if somebody knows, if you know somebody is disgusted by you, how much do you want to open up to them? Not very much. I think we need to pre-decide a response. What kind of person, what kind of relationship do I want to have? And let's move on to the last one. The last piece of advice I have for older generations is to tell your stories. See, there's, there's this thing we do where we give advice to people, and how often does advice stick? Right? How many times have you given advice and it wasn't accepted? Right? Advice just... It, it's like it goes in one ear and out the other. It bounces off of us because everybody's got advice, right? Advice is a diamond dozen. It, it, it's so easy to not take advice, but it's really hard to not listen to a story. I, I may not take advice sometimes, but I'll always listen to a story. And I believe that when we're telling these stories, the degree to which we are vulnerable and honest is the degree to which young people will be vulnerable and honest with us, right? If we tell some half-thought-through story about how kids were different, you know, when we were younger and that kids today are ruining the world, like, that's not going to engage with somebody, right? Or uh, imagine this situation. Imagine somebody comes to you and they're like, greatest thing just happened to me, right? I got a credit card. I didn't even know free money was a thing, but now I have it through my credit card, Right? What do you want to do in that moment? Well, you should throw away that credit card. Cut it up, right, into a million pieces. Put it in the shredder. I'll cut it up. Give it to me. I'll put it in the shredder, right? We want to give advice. And, and like, that advice just seems to bounce off, doesn't it? Right? Like, oh, you're just ancient. You don't know what the world's like today. We all have this free money. Everyone is in crippling debt. We're all anxious, right? That's just how it is to live today. Now, imagine... A response of somebody saying, oh my gosh, are, are you sure you want to go down that road? You see, when, when your mother and I were growing up, we, we thought the same thing. We got these credit cards and we're like, oh man, this is free money. But before we knew what happened, we were in over our heads and it felt like the bank had us by the throats and there was nothing we could do. And we, we, we got de like depressed, we were fighting with each other. I don't think you want to go down this road because I've been down that road. One of those is so much easier to swallow, right? We, we know this. When we are honest, when we tell our stories, people can listen to us. They can connect with us. They can feel the emotion 
in the passion behind what you're saying opposed to advice that's super easy to ignore. Now, uh, that, that's my last piece of advice that I have for you, older generation. And I hope that something in here was helpful today because I, I believe that this is super important. I believe that this, is, this should be one of the most important things about us as a church. We should be different than other generation or other, other groups of people. As a church, we should be <clears throat> known for how we get along. How even, even though we're different and we believe different things and we value different things, we value the one thing, or, or the one thing we value most is we share that in common and that thing unites us. I think we should be eager to work toward this kind of relationships. I think what Peter is describing where our, our older people are, want the younger people to succeed is, man, that, that's like the dream. As a younger person and as an older person, we know that the value of our lives is measured by how much we give away of it. Have you ever been to a funeral? And like the stories people tell are not about how great your car was and how many people you were the boss of. The, the stories we tell at funerals are about how much of your life you've given away. And I believe that if, like, if that's actually true for us, if it's true that we can do this, I think we need to start moving in that direction. I, I know this is what I want for myself, and I know it's possible because I've been a product of this. I have people scattered all through my life who wanted to see me win not because it would make them look good or because they could make me bend to their will, but because they just cared about me. And I tried to do the exact same thing for our students. And I, I hope that today you will leave with some tools that you can put into practice because this is important. This, is, this, this should be one of the, the most important characteristics about us. We could get along as the church. Now, I want to leave you with one thing as the, the band comes up. I want to leave you with one more piece of uh, knowledge or one more piece of advice. When you talk to somebody, this generational stuff is helpful, right? It's helpful to know what people value, what system people were brought up in. But most importantly, I think we need to, to talk to individuals and not a generation. You ever been stereotyped before you even opened your mouth in a conversation? Oh, you're just an entitled young person, right? Oh, you're just a lame old guy. You don't know what you're talking about, right? The world's not the same anymore. We don't like it when people do that. It's not just annoying. It hurts when people do that to us. So today I want to leave you with this. I want to encourage you to, to see people as individuals and, and try to figure out what's important to them rather than doing what we as Americans generally do. Just expect other people to speak our language, right? That's what we're notorious for when we travel, you know? I'm, we, we just say it louder, and we say it slower, hoping that that effort is going to make you suddenly understand what I'm trying to say, right? That's, that's kind of our shtick as Americans, isn't it? Why don't you just learn to speak the right way? But I think we all know through experience that doesn't really work. Would you guys pray with me? Lord, thank you so much for inviting us to be part of this awesome and diverse group of people known as your church. Lord, we want to be known by the way we love each other and the way we, we care about each other and the way we move to make other people succeed in life. Help us to move in that direction, Lord. We know this is important. We know this is how you've designed us to be. And we also know that it's, it's pretty easy to pretend like everyone else is the problem. But Lord, I, I ask that I can be part, help me be part of the solution. Help us all be part of the solution. I pray these things in your son's name. Amen.